did, I'd be in big trouble. So I am thankful today that God is with us and God is leading the way. the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of be with you. Let us pray. 
Almighty God, whom truly to know is everlasting life. Grant us so perfectly to know your Son, Jesus Christ, to be the way, the truth, and the life, that we may steadfastly follow his steps in the way that leads to eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Please be seated. Jesus is the foundation of our faith. His life, death, and resurrection is a fearsome thing to believe, but it is the way of salvation. A reading from 1 Peter. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow into salvation. If indeed you have tasted that, the Lord is good. Come to him, a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. And like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house. To be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in scripture, see, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. To you then who believe, he is precious. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the very head of the corner and a stone that makes them stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the word, as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, <clears throat> a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We will now read Psalm 31 by half verse. In you, O Lord, have I taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. Incline your ear to me. Be my strong rock, a castle to keep me safe, for you are my crag and my stronghold. Take me out of the net that they have secretly set for me. Into your hands I commend my spirit, for you have redeemed me, O Lord of God of truth. My times are in your hand. Make your face to shine upon your servant.
as I stand on every promise of your word. Grace sufficient, grace for me, grace for all who will believe. We will stand on every promise of The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Jesus told his disciples, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, but if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do. And, in fact, will do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If, in my name, you ask me for anything, I will do it. The Gospel of the Lord. May my words be of you, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Please be seated. I want to begin this morning um, by first saying an enormous thank you to the clergy, the staff, the leaders, and all those who made it possible for 16 people including Kip and me and Junior Warden Bill Spaulding to be on pilgrimage in the Holy Land for two weeks, including three Sundays. We could not have gone without willing, capable, and hardworking people to carry responsibility here at home. So thank you particularly to the office staff, Laura Pesesnik, Michael Larkin, Nicole Bova, to the clergy, Chuck Stewart, Jim Coral, and Bishop Skip Adams, to Nancy Graham, who oversees pastoral care, and especially to Senior Warden Suzanne Rankowitz, who kept important details of the transition moving forward all along during that time. So thank you, everyone. Not everybody can make the trip to the Holy Land. So I want to take some time this morning to share about it so that more of you can have a taste of what we experienced. There is, in fact, something extraordinary about traveling to the Holy Land. Ever since I was ordained, people said to me, Becky, you really need to go. And I thought, yeah, yeah, whatever. But it is, in fact, a life-changing experience to be in the Holy Land. 
and to visit the sites significant to Jesus' life and ministry. The land itself is referred to as the fifth gospel because there is something about seeing it about walking where Jesus walked that changes how one reads scripture. For one thing, being there corrects some of the mental pictures that we may have had about the landscape. Uh, Many people are really surprised that instead of looking like the St. Lawrence Seaway, that the Jordan River is this muddy little stream that... uh, is probably 12 feet across and not very deep. Being in the Holy Land also draws one closer to the person of Jesus when you see what he saw, when you stand where he may have stood, and you walk in the places where he also walked. It is incredible to stand on the Mount of Olives and to look over the city of Jerusalem remembering that Jesus stood there himself and wept over that same city. It's powerful to sit in the Judean wilderness, this vast expanse of mountains, in fact, contemplating the barren majesty of that landscape, knowing that Jesus did the same thing. It's awe-inspiring to see the wall that surrounds the old city of Jerusalem, the very stones that Herod the Great had put in place, and to know that Jesus saw those same stones. And it is truly awe-inspiring to be with the vast number of believers from all over the world who speak and dress and think differently, but who are all drawn to the Holy Land for the same reason, that we were. In the words of the very Reverend Richard Sewell, Dean of St. George's College, where we stayed and studied, all of us, these hundreds and thousands of people, come to the Holy Land because of the empty tomb, because Jesus lives. It is Jesus who draws each and every one of these pilgrims to be in that particular part of the world. There were so many highlights in our brief two weeks, so many surprises, so many rich moments of worship, of reflection, of conversation with other pilgrims. And I want to share just one. I apologize to the people who've already heard this story. A week into the pilgrimage, we packed our bags, got on a bus, and traveled north to the Sea of Galilee. Our first day there, we had time on the shore when we listened to the stories from Scripture about Jesus' time in that region and his time walking on those very shores. We saw ruins of what very likely was Peter's house where Jesus would have visited. And while we were there, another group from Ghana gathered under a tree at the edge of the water, probably 30 or 40 people. And they were nearby where we were standing ourselves. They began to sing and to pray and to praise. And the presence of the Holy Spirit, their sense of worship was palpable such that those of us who were standing near were drawn to move even closer. Several of the songs that they sang were um, in their own native language, but two of them were in English, and they were songs that we knew, so we started to sing too and moved even closer. And as I felt pulled in and um, just kind of awed by the beauty of their worship, I thought about the fact that I didn't know these people. I couldn't speak their language. We didn't look alike or have the same life experience. But one thing, the most important thing, we had in common, and that's Jesus. It is an incredible experience to be in a place where all of the time you're coming in contact with people from all over the world 
who are there overtly expressing their deep faith and their love of Jesus. Asian people, African people, people from Eastern Europe, people from South and Central America, people from Australia. Seeing all those people is witnessing that the gospel has truly spread to the ends of the earth. The author of the first letter, Peter, writes that his readers and every generation since are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, for one reason. In order that we may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called us out of darkness and into the marvelous light. Because people in every generation have known and loved Jesus, have been filled by the power of the Holy Spirit and have witnessed to the risen Christ. We are here today. And now it is our privilege and our responsibility to share, to make Jesus known by the witness of our words and our lives. But there's something else that this experience by the Sea of Galilee revealed to me there is a oneness that is created by knowing Jesus. We are one with each other. We are bound together in one family by the love of Jesus. I mentioned that being in the Holy Land corrects the mental pictures that we have about Scripture. And this experience of oneness that was particularly keen listening to our brothers and sisters from Ghana that experience of oneness changed how I hear the passage that we read from the Gospel of John. We often hear this text at funerals. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places, and I go to prepare a place for you. Now, I feel a little foolish saying this right now, but whenever I've heard that passage, I've always imagined a dormitory. Everybody gets their own little cell. But coming into a relationship with Jesus is coming into a relationship with all God's children. And we don't live any longer in these separate little lives. We are bound to one another. We are part of a community. We didn't go to the Holy Land as separate individuals. We went as a group. And we became a family. We cared for one another. We shared stuff with one another. We prayed for each other. We helped each other. And that's what Jesus showed us in his own relationships with people. Our life with God connects us deeply with others. So now when I imagine the place that Jesus is preparing, I. I, I envision a, a gigantic space with everyone all crowded around together. God invites us all to come close, and there's room for everyone to be near God, to know God, to feel God's love, to be filled with God's power, and to be there together in one space. But the Holy Land isn't just a place that Christians go. It's also a place with huge numbers of Jews and Muslims. In fact, Christians are in, the, in a very small minority in the Holy Land. And all the Jews and the Muslims live their faith and their prayer very publicly. People of other faiths are drawn to the Holy Land in the same way that Christians are, which begs a question about something that Jesus said in this passage from John. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Christians have often heard these words of Jesus to mean that unless you believe in Jesus, unless you confess Jesus, you cannot come to the Father. In fact, it is probably this passage that as much as any other has promoted violence by Christians against people of other faiths. 
commentator Caroline Lewis says that the problem with how this passage has so frequently been interpreted, and here I quote her, is that it becomes an indication of God's judgment, exclusion, and absence, rather than a word of promise. End of quote. If this passage says that a few are in but many are out, it contradicts the well-known declaration in John 3, God so loved the world. Not just a small group of people. So notice with me that the English words say no one comes to the Father except through me. That is actually a fairly opaque statement. How exactly does that work? What if Jesus is saying that the work he has come to do, his life, his death, his resurrection and ascension, open a door, make it possible for the rest of us to have the kind of close, intimate relationship with God the Father that Jesus has? Without the saving work of Jesus, no one would be able to draw near to God, to abide with God. But because of Jesus, that door is open. We don't really need to know more than that. We only need to understand that Jesus came so that everyone might come to the Father, and the rest is up to God. I would like to ask the pilgrims who are present here this morning to stand so that everyone can see who you are. Thank you. So I'm going to invite everybody to seek out these folks, to talk to them, to ask them about their experience. Ask them, what, what surprised you? What takeaways did you bring back? What was it like? One of the last things that Dean Richard said to us was, it's your turn now to witness to what you have experienced here. Our pilgrimage was not just for our own benefit. It was also for you. Amen. We believe God the Father We believe in the Son We believe in the Holy Spirit Three persons in one And we believe in the crucifixion Where He conquered death We believe in the resurrection He's coming Given a new life by the risen Christ, let us pray for all who stand in need of grace, hope, and life.
In this diocese, we pray for our bishop, the Right Reverend Dr. Dee Dee Duncan Proby, the people of the Church of the Epiphany in Trumansburg, and the people of Grace Episcopal Church in Utica, and their priest, the Reverend Christine Williams Belt. In the Episcopal Church, we pray for our presiding bishop, the Most Reverend Michael Curry, and the people of the Diocese of, of Hawaii, and their bishop, the Right Reverend Robert Fitzpatrick. In the Anglican Communion, we pray for the people of the Church in Wales and their prime bishop, the Most Reverend Andrew John. God of new life, hear our prayer. For the whole world, that the crucified and risen Christ will mend what is broken and fill all corners of the earth with justice and peace. God of new life, hear our prayer. For creation, that we may have wisdom and reverence so to use the resources of nature responsibly, that generations to come may continue to praise you for your bounty. God of new life, hear our prayer. For the Onondaga nation of the Haudenosaunee people, the traditional custodians of the land on which we are worshiping today. We acknowledge and express our gratitude that they have occupied and cared for this land over countless generations, and we celebrate their continuing contributions to the life of this region. God of new life, for our prayer. For all who are overshadowed by illness of body, mind, and spirit, especially those we now name. That the Holy Spirit's healing and life-giving presence will touch their lives, God of new life. That all who await new life, those about to be born and those about to die, will know Christ's presence with them, God of new life. That with all the faithful who have died, especially those we now name, we will join in songs of praise of the victory feast of God who triumphs over death and gives eternal life, God of new life. Gracious God, we give you thanks. Hear our prayers and receive them for the sake of the crucified and risen one, our Savior Jesus Christ. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Welcome again. I uh, want to make a plea. We have all morning long have enjoyed a fellowship brunch in the parish hall, and the people who came before you did not eat enough. <laughs> so there is tons of food left. We need you to come and uh, enjoy not only the food, but some fellowship and maybe even be willing to take some food home as well. And thank you to Fred and Cheryl Spino for making that happen. Today, oh, all kinds of treats today. Um, at the uh, close of the service, outside on the sidewalk, there is a table that has been provided by the Creation Care Ministry and is um, going to be manned by Chris Baker and Rich Croft of Bartlett Tree Experts, and we, they are giving away saplings that can grow to a height of 70 feet, apparently. Um, so please do take home a tree and uh, plant that in your yard. And, um, just remember the 
the important ministry that we continue to have here at St. James that is about stewardship of creation. May is the month of community service. There is a link on the uh, website, a banner heading that you can click on that takes you to the Sign Up Genius so you can sign up for all kinds of ways to serve in the community, but that information is also in print in the weekly and in the spirit if it's easier for you um, to, ha to have it that way. Um, I think even though we've already, this is already finished, I think we need to let folks know that there's a new ministry that the, children, um, it, the children's ministry is doing here at St. James, and that it started today and periodically once a month. There's going to be a story time following the 9 o'clock service, and so it did happen today down in Saints in Training, and it's just a great time for kids to come in a less formal atmosphere and hear stories uh, of faith and for parents to be able to stand around and socialize as well. So that's at uh, ten, gonna be at 10.15 about once a month and you'll hear more about that as time goes by. Next Sunday, we are going to have a major update on the transition. It is a month until uh, Kip and I have our last Sunday here at St. James and there has been a lot going on behind the scenes that you will not have noticed yet. So we want to begin sharing some of those details with you, the plans and the people that are already in place for the coming weeks and months so that you know what to expect. Uh, Canon Carrie Schofield Broadbent is going to be with us at all three services to speak about the transition from the diocesan perspective. Uh, since the last time she was here, she was elected Bishop Coadjutor in the Diocese of Maryland, so she is also going to be leaving at the end of the month. Um, and so the reason that she's going to be here on Sunday is to let us know what the diocesan um, support is going to be through our transition. I want to um, invite some folks, 14 people, to come forward. I did this at the earlier service and couldn't understand why they weren't there, because they were going to be here. Um, but th there you go. So th this group of folks has completed a mini pastoral care training that has been focused on listening, and we want to commission them. So I'm going to invite you just to come forward and stand right here. Don Altmeyer, Nancy Austin, Barbara Baker, Barb Burton, Corinne Buderbaugh, who I know is um, away, Chris Davis, Carolyn Ebner, Lynn Gregory, Nancy Lee, Kathy Plouffe, Mary McGrath, Meg Osborne, and Kathleen Underwood. Just don't be shy. I think you should. I think you should come stand with me, actually. All right, so come on. Turn around and look at your uh, brothers and sisters here. I think you could read this with me, Nancy. So we're just going to say this part, no names, and then go on to here. Okay? Let us pray. Oh God, we ask you to take our sisters into your care. You have blessed them with particular gifts and talents and have provided them with an opportunity to learn more about helping people. May they serve you with the power of the Holy Spirit. May they be quick to serve, patient in listening, willing to share themselves with people. Give to us thankful hearts for them and show them in times of stress and satisfaction a special measure of your mercy and joy. Keep them strong in the faith you have given them for the sake of Jesus, who cares for all of us in every way. Amen. So these folks gathered seven Saturdays? I have not said a single thing right all morning about this. Well, why start now, right? But uh, two hours for what will be seven weeks. That's a huge commitment and learned a lot about listening, right? Mostly about listening. So thank you all. And you are going to, there's going to be a ripple effect out from this group that is going to be a really positive impact at St. James and in the wider community. So thank you for your time and your ministry. Amen.
And just because it's fun to change things up, nobody thinks that. Um, we, we had an experience in the Holy Land uh, of a different way to distribute communion that I had heard about and could never just wrap my brain around, but it really is very simple, and so we're going to try it because there's a, be there's a couple of different benefits to it. So what we're going to do is um, same two lines that we always have for communion, two stations, but those of us who are administering the bread are going to have the option of dipping it first into the chalice of wine so that anybody who wants to can receive bread and wine without having to drink directly from the chalice. And our hands are going to be very sanitized and no dipping of fingers into the wine, which is the part that's not sanitary. If you don't want to receive wine, and, and some people won't, just say no wine and we'll give you just the wafer. But um, we, we did learn something at the earlier service that, you know, Episcopalians do this and then what you're getting is a sticky, wet wafer in your hand and m m that's maybe not going to be your preference. So I encourage you to do, to pinch and between your thumb and forefinger to take the the wafer from us. Is that as clear as mud? Pardon? Can I do that? I, I've been practicing, yes, I can do that without touching anything. Yes, if that's your preference. We'll see how it goes. The people at the first two services liked it, so you, you let us give us your feedback, okay? We do want to know what you think. I am aware of one birthday and one anniversary um, Laura and Terry Pesesnik are celebrating their 18th today. Woohoo! And Chuck Stewart's birthday was yesterday. And he's not here because he, you know, didn't want it, that attention. But we're going to give it to him anyway because that's how we are. So if you would, any, is there anybody else? Nancy. It's your 25th. Did you tell me that and I forgot? I've got this fog thing going on from jet lag, I think. You didn't. All right, so 25th wedding anniversary. 40? 40, 45. That's a big deal. Is it your birthday, Kate? You already had one. Yeah? Wednesday. Well, we, we do that. We, we pray for birthdays that already went by. Is there anybody else? Are, were you 18? 19. Oh, my gosh. Oh, and Martha, were you 19 also? 29? 25. You were 25? Do you know you're in church? <laughs> Amazing to me. Anybody else? Why not? All right, let's say the anniversary and birthday blessing. May the strength of God pilot you. May the power of God preserve you. May the wisdom of God instruct you. May the hand of God protect you. May the way of God direct you. May the shield of God guard you against the snares of evil and the temptations of the world. And may the Spirit of God bless you in the coming year. Know that whoever you are and wherever you may be on your journey in faith, you are invited to the Lord's table this morning. Praise is that I 
sitting or kneeling as you prefer. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. But chiefly are we bound to praise you for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. For he is the true Paschal Lamb who was sacrificed for us and has taken away the sin of the world. By his death he has destroyed death, and by his rising to life again he has won for us everlasting life. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Oh. 
Gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you, in your mercy, sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast. Alleluia. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. The congregation may begin coming forward. Remember me as you eat his bread. When you come 
Standing, sitting, or kneeling as you prefer, let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. May we who have received the gift of God's reconciling love be his body for the world, his hands to bring blessing, and his joy in the promise of creation restored. And may Almighty God bless you Renew the risen life of Christ within you and bring forth in you the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh. 
Let us go forth in the name of the risen Christ. Alleluia, alleluia. See you. 